JJ the CPA here. Hope you're doing well. So the SBA just before midnight last night uh, released some uh, IFRs, two of them. These are interim financial rules. And uh, so I've skimmed them and uh, I'm going to just go over the highlights with you. I'm going to put a link to both of these um, IFRs from the SBA in the body of this video. You won't need to go anywhere to get them. You'll just get them direct. They're also on the SBA. And um, I'm just going to go through some highlights with you. And I'll do some specific videos by subject. But if you would like to know what's in these, I'll tell you right off the bat for those of you that don't necessarily want to stick around to listen to all of it, that uh, some things that I thought was minorly new information is that the PPP 2.0 at this point, being January 7th, is going to close on March 31st. So there's some time there. If you're going to apply for an increase to PPP 1, then that'll also close March 31st. My understanding on getting money related to PPP 1 would be that you already applied for it and you'd be going for an increase. Let's see a couple other things. If you are going to qualify for PPP 2, you may already know this because I put this in other videos, but you get the higher of your payroll costs of 19 or 20 in terms of doing the calculation. What does that mean? So if you take your payroll costs for 2019 divided by 12 times 2.5, which really should have been most likely your PPP1 amount. So you figure that out. You do the same calculation except for 2020. Take your annual payroll costs divided by 12 times 2.5. So whatever figure is higher, that can be your PPP loan for 2.0. What the guidelines indicate here uh, well, IFRs indicate is that if you're getting the PPP2 and you're going to base it off 2019 payroll costs and you're going with the same lender, you don't have to provide any documentation to the lender with PPP2 because they should already have all of that information. So that would make that quicker. I know a lot of us had less payroll in 2020, and we would probably know that off the top of our heads. Um, if your business has been affected, you were closed, etc., and you would probably then know that 2019 potentially is the higher amount. So that should help. As it relates to providing the documentation, these are still some major highlights right here. So if you're not interested in the minutia, I haven't even gotten into the minutia. But some other major highlights, uh, I've alluded to this uh, previously, but this goes through it further, that the documentation to show that your gross receipts have declined by 25% or more in any quarter in 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019, you'll provide that at the time of forgiveness. Uh, so with that being said, that would probably help at least with the paperwork, but I'm doing a seminar tomorrow. I already had it planned. Um, I expanded uh, the 10 a.m. one. Now, this is January 7th. I plan this seminar for January 8th and a seminar for January 9th, probably three weeks ago. And uh, my 10 a.m. Uh, is sold out, but I went and just upgraded Zoom to allow more participants. Uh, it's a nominal amount. So, by the time this video comes out, it'll be almost 4 p.m. Central Standard Time on the 7th. So not a lot of time. I won't talk much further because you're going to probably, most of you will see this video after I have that seminar. But if you want to go to the seminar, I was already going to be going over this stuff. Now I have more stuff to go over. Um, so anyways, check that out. Not the purpose of this video, but nonetheless, if you want to go to a Zoom seminar and go through my um, PDF of the PowerPoint um, uh, that seminar will be inclusive of that. It's two hours with an hour of Q&A. Let's see. Uh, if lenders, still the major points. Uh, I will tell you this, if you don't mind, um, if, if uh, you're new to my channel, uh, check out my other videos. Be sure you're checking the playlist. 
um, because I've got things broken out. Like I have one just on PPP2. I've got one that's on uh, just anything new related to the stimulus. I have one on EIDL. I have one on forgiveness. And uh, typically those are going to be in order of when they came out and or you can just go to my main page, if you will, on YouTube and you can see the videos in chronological order if you put it in showing the newest first. And I'm a practicing CPA and so I'm thorough. So I'm trying to give you as uh, as much information uh, as I can still on the major points if you are... Uh, looking when will the simplified forgiveness applications be out uh, for PPP1. That's expected 24 days after the enactment, which was on December 28th. Uh, there's nothing in here related to the EIDL grants or advances uh, that came out of the new Stimulus Act. And let's see. Let me see. It seems like there's just one other major point, and then those of you that want to move along, you can. Uh, Oh, if you are comparing your gross receipts from 2020 to 2019, of course you have to to determine if you qualify for PPP1, uh, it does allow for those that are getting less than $150,000 of PPP2 to just use the full year. And if you're using the full year, then at the time of forgiveness, you'll hand in your tax return for 2019 and tax return for 2020 because it'll be based on the gross receipts on the tax returns. Now, of course, you're not going to have your 2020 tax return right now, most likely January 7th for 2020. Um, So the point is, is that you don't have to, as I indicated earlier, provide the documentation showing that your revenue has been reduced until you apply for forgiveness. So you are able to go with what you know, which by now you should know what your gross is for 2020, even if you don't have a tax return done. But that's a simplification there. So if you just know you've had a down year and you don't want to necessarily have to try and figure out it quarter by quarter and your year is down by 25% or more for 2020 compared to 2019, then that helps, which I think um, is nice related to that. All right, so that was the major items. Uh, I know a lot of CPAs tune into my channel, which I'm honored by, EAs, honored, tax professionals, honored by that. And so, again, I'm going to put a link in here. Uh, Here's my notes that I was just going through. So I'm now just going to go through my notes. And uh, some of this you may already know, but it just was driven home here. So uh, those that are applying for PPP2, it's for 300 employees or less at one physical location, which that's key. Uh, The 25% we already talked about the last day is March 31st to get PPP2. You know, they may extend that. They did last time. On the gross receipts, uh, it really indicates uh, in the... 13 CFR 121-104. Well, I wrote that down, but scratch what I just said. I wrote down 13 CFR 121-104, but that doesn't appear to be uh, either of these. So that must have been something that I was looking at in comparison. Scratch what I just said about 13 CFR, just because I don't know where I came up with that. Here's the bottom line. On the gross receipts, it is what's on your tax return. It's your tax basis. If you read this, that's the conclusion you draw. So if you're accrual, you're accrual. If you're cash, you're cash. Um, But it is going to include, in essence, whatever is considered income on that tax return. Now, what will be interesting is, you know, we know that there could be flow through income that shows up in that gross receipt. So Take a look because it does go through. It provides a nice list uh, as it relates to this. Um, it drives home a little bit more on the businesses that have the code starting with 72, their NAICS code, that they get the 3.5 factor, basically those that are in uh, the restaurant related type industries. It does definitely drive home, which I haven't seen a lot of people talk about when I read the law. I knew it said this, but I haven't found any articles that really talked about it. But it is, in fact, the higher of 
your PPP2 amount is the higher of whatever you want to go with, 19 or 20 on the payroll costs. Uh, the inclusion of the payroll costs for PPP2 um, are the same. It appears that for PPP forgiveness, and you got to remember, I mean, this came out very recent. So those that are still stuck around, the CPAs, EAs, tax professionals, most likely, and then wonderful um, subscribers that have been with me since the beginning. But it seems as though that for forgiveness, it is clear that with payroll costs, you get to include group life um, and group disability. So that's the group plans. You know, that's not very much vision and dental. Um, but it, it, it seemed as though that was all part of the forgiveness. I'm not seeing that it's part of the PPP2 amount. So I'll get through that to clarify that later. And um, I think I talked about that no additional documentation if the borrower is going to base it off 19. So that probably helps. And reminder that it will all be public info who got PPP2 regardless of the amount, um, as that was done with PPP1. Um, it does indicate, uh, and I was at an AICPA um, town hall, which helped me come up with these notes. I, did had, I had been going through these, and then I saw we had the town hall, so I went through the town hall as well. But uh, there's a form 2483-SD. And uh, my understanding from the two banks that I work closely with here in Oklahoma is that the PPP2 application um, with the update on 1231 was going to be the PPP2 application. Well, it's been used. It's been used by banks, I think, just in place of it, of them um, needing to have something that was you know, in their file, so to speak. So I know a number of banks, and I've seen articles across the country, uh, where that application is being used so far for PPP2. But it does seem that probably within either today or tomorrow, we know SBA is famous for putting stuff out Friday afternoon. Um, but anyways, it'll be Form 2483-SD. It appears that'll be the, the, the official PPP2 application. Uh, so by the way, I took down the uh, videos where I'd indicated the PPP2 application is out. And then when this comes out, then I'll put a link to this. And uh, so then I'll put those videos uh, back up. You probably don't know, but when stuff becomes obsolete, I uh, take the videos down or if something needs to be corrected or updated. So nonetheless, if you're uh, seeing the form 2483-SD, that's for the second draw. And then what was interesting is that when you read the law, it looked as though somebody had to have already used up their PPP-1 uh, funds to be able to qualify or apply for PPP-2. But these guidelines indicate that the PPP-1 has to have been used or will be used, which is kind of interesting because it needed to have been you know, used all by the end of 20. But nonetheless, with all the changes, that's how it reads. So uh, someone will be able to just get PPP2 regardless uh, of PPP1 use or forgiveness. And I've been saying that uh, from the beginning. Lenders may ask for PPP forgiveness application, and it's simply not required. So just be up to us to dig in our heels on that if need be. And if you uh, got the first draw, um, but you want more, because uh, you qualify for more, quite frankly, because they changed the rules. Um, you can go for more, but check this out. For Schedule F filers, so that's those that are in farming and ranching, cattle, wonderful individuals in those industries, um, Schedule F. Um, if it is this kind of Schedule F that's you know subject to self-employment tax, but check this out. For Schedule F filers only, PPP1 can be based on the net or the gross. What? Schedule F only. So if you don't have a farm or a ranch, you can just ignore it. You can use the gross. So for farmers and ranchers, if they don't qualify for PPP2 for whatever reason, or maybe they do, they would be able to reapply for PPP1. And of course, they had to have already gotten PPP1. Okay, But they can then go in and request an increase 
by using the gross from Schedule F. Seasonal uh, is considered no more than seven months uh, that it's open throughout the year. And then if the, they did clarify in here that a business that has closed permanently will not be able to take PPP2. Seems obvious, but they did make that clear. And then on the simplified forgiveness, it really does seem uh, clear that they're making a difference, that it is not automatic forgiveness. It's not automatic forgiveness. It's simplified forgiveness. You still have to, in essence, uh, you know, certify that the amount you're putting down for forgiveness is actually the amount that was calculated properly as forgiveness. So even if somebody got less than 150000 if they got too much, then they may they still need to pay back what they got too much of. How would that be? Uh, how would that come about easily? Well, Schedule C, 2019. We know that potentially a bank lent out too much to Schedule C filers, especially uh, before April 14th, because there wasn't as much guidelines. And so I know of individuals that have Schedule C, and their PPP is forty-eight thousand dollars. And they had a huge Schedule C for 2019 when they were applying. And the bank took that net, divided by 12 times two and a half, here you go. But we know the forgiveness amount is no more than a $100,000 start figure, divided by 12 times 2.5. What's that mean? For the self-employed, the maximum that can be forgiven is 20833 unless they have employees, which is very few. If they have employees, then it's a maximum twenty thousand eight thirty three plus whatever the payroll costs are that they used during the covered period, et cetera. So unfortunately, I think there's going to probably be a lot of people that either misunderstand it or they say, you know, catch me if I can. And if you've been watching me from the beginning, uh, you know that I have very little patience for that. Uh, so, for instance, in the seminar, you know, I've had some that have said, well, you know, you're going to cover PPP forgiveness. You know, why? Um, you know, if you have 150000 or less, it's like, well, <laughs> the reason we're going to cover PPP forgiveness is that you do have to still come up with the correct amount of forgiveness. You're basically lying, cheating, committing fraud straight up. Everybody goes like, oh, it's not fraud. It's fraud. <laughs> it's fraud to put down an incorrect amount of forgiveness. I mean, might as well just walk into the federal bank and tell them to stick them up. All right, I'll, I'll back down on that. If you haven't watched me very long, uh, just know I'm passionate about doing this uh, properly. Uh, one other thing that's interesting uh, and is great for those of you that have uh, 7A loans and the SBA is making payments on your behalf. This has nothing to do with PPP. This would be an SBA loan that you had previously, like an official SBA loan. So if, if you're unsure if you had an SBA loan, you probably don't have an SBA loan because SBA loans, and I'm not talking about EIDLs or any loans you really would have gotten this year. I'm talking about SBA loans that you probably had to jump through more hoops and sign off on more documents, and it couldn't have been more clear to you that you got an SBA loan, again, all before the pandemic, these 7A loans that we're talking about, which is just a code section with the SBA, they're extending for three months the amount of time that they'll continue to make the payments uh, for those that qualify, and it won't be considered income, and they'll be able to deduct the expenses related to that. So if you're like, well, wait a second, what is that, JJ? I, I'm not. I'm just trying to. It, you probably doesn't apply to you. If this sounds like new information for you, this doesn't have anything to do with PPP uh, or the uh, EIDL. And then I think that's it. I think that's it. So most of you know. If you made it to here, you've you've tuned into my channel probably since the beginning. Hope you're doing well. Love you. Uh, do plan to start back live when we have a little bit more information, probably starting next week to do the Q&As like I did in the past. You probably know that most of the time when I get on a video, I don't even refer to notes. Um, and honestly, I got, uh, I skimmed this. Uh, and then the, the AICPA town hall meeting was uh, very helpful uh, to go back through. Um, and it allowed me to double check some items and... Uh, all right, so at the end of the day, guess what I'm doing? Now, again, this is January 7th, and again, 
I'm talking about two seminars that are out on January 8th. Um, so let me just say this really quick, and then I'm going to tell you about the seminars. So listen, if it's after January 8th, January 9th, uh, if you're tuning in, you're not a subscriber, I'd love it if you'd subscribe. I don't make any money off of your subscription, um, but it allows me to know that I'm putting out good information. I'm a CPA. I like to see numbers go up. Turn on your notifications. going to be a lot of new stuff coming out. Stay tuned for the employee retention uh, new information that we'll be getting once the IRS comes out. Uh, with that, we get the new forms. There's going to be a number of videos uh, doing the calculations. Uh, so I won't do my full sign off on it, but uh, now I'm going to talk about the seminars. So if this is after January 9th, as a courtesy, I'm just letting you know that uh, if you're watching,